Well, now you know. <laughs> well, how can we forgive others? And over the past uh, number of Sundays, we've been uh, talking about some of the wounds that we have, how we can heal those wounds. And we talked about this healing experience. And through Christ, the healings that he gives us and the wounds that we experience, we begin to learn it's, it's actually a process. We can experience suffering and receiving. We, what I mean by that is we, a few weeks ago, we explored this whole aspect. Well, what do we do when we suffer? You know, why do we suffer? Because we ask that question, or why do we experience trauma? Why do we go through wounds of the heart? And in those, during those seasons of our lives, we begin to understand that God is the one. Yes, he still loves us, and we can receive his strengthening. We talked about being heard and listening. Not only do we express our feelings to others, but we also especially listen to others in their pain. We talked about grieving and lamenting, calling out to God, telling God about our pain, asking God for help, affirming our own trust in God. We talked about bringing our pain to the cross, acknowledging that when Jesus died on the cross, not only did he bear our sins, but he also carried the pains. Not only does he forgive us, but he also heals us. Today, looking at forgiving others, and then in this healing experience that we have, we also go through, we revisit these areas of our lives. We allow the healing power of God to continue to work in our lives and rebuild and develop resilience. And finding as we do so, we're more able to face suffering in the future. And so whatever we face, good days, bad days, we, we, we realize that it's all part of the journey and we are walking in step with God, including him in our journey as we walk together with him. Today, our last talk in this area of healing our wounds, how can we forgive others? It's an honest question. What do we do when somebody has hurt us? What do we do when somebody has wounded us? What do we do when somebody promised something but they didn't come through? What do we do when, when, when people have said bad things about us? And also, what do you do when someone has not apologized to you? We've all had that experience. And if you think forgiving is just too hard, you're right. We need God's help. So that's where we start. We start by being honest about our pain and bringing it to Jesus. Psalm 6, 3, and 7. Here this psalmist is crying out to God, my soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. He's facing challenges. And when we forgive somebody, we acknowledge that person has wounded us, that person has hurt us, that person has sinned against us. We don't minimize the pain like the psalmist. We are also honest with God. This is how I feel. And the pain, it may last a long time. So what do we do? We keep bringing our pains to Jesus. We keep bringing them there. He understands our pains. He understands criticism. He, he was crucified. And he was the one who will help us forgive those who have hurt us. We also, in our journey of healing, we release the offender to God without waiting for them to apologize. Practically, what happens? We say to ourselves, I'm not going to forgive that person until they apologize to me. Or we say, I'm not going to forgive that person until I see change in their behavior. Then I'll forgive them. You look at the example of Jesus, Stephen, they ask God to forgive those people, they were forgiving those people while they were being killed. Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Acts 7, 59 and 60, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He was forgiving them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
So when we forgive people, we're not wishing harm on them. We're not wishing evil on them. We're not trying to pay back that person for what they have done to us. Rather, we're putting it, them into God's hands. We're letting God handle that department. Our job is to forgive. When President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, his 12-year-old son, Tad, spent that miserable night beneath his father's desk in the executive office. And Tad said, if Pa had lived, he would have forgiven the man who shot him because Pa forgave everybody. And here's one aspect about forgiveness that I'm learning. Allow time for the forgiveness process. I don't think I've really understood this as much before. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall, shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So here's what I'm learning is that forgiveness is a process. It doesn't happen all at once. We decide to forgive and then suddenly remember what has, how we were offended, how we were wounded. We begin to feel those angry thoughts, bitterness, resentment. We take that pain to Jesus again. We reaffirm our commitment to forgive. The Christian Trauma Institute uh, provides these illustrations. I found them very helpful. The first uh, forgiveness cycle that you see there illustrates the cage of the offense and freedom. At first, we don't really feel like forgiving somebody, but that doesn't matter. We commit ourselves to forgive that person before we feel feelings of forgiveness. And like the bird in the diagram, we may circle back many times in our hearts toward that cage of the offense. But as we forgive in our hearts over and over, again and again, eventually we feel that our pain begins to lessen when we remember that event. And just like a bird flies higher and further from the cage toward freedom, we increasingly move ourselves toward freedom each time we renew our commitment to forgive. The second cycle of forgiveness diagram there shows that the, the, fence, the offense and our freedom is, is, is miles apart. So we forgive at the one mile mark, then we forgive at the two mile mark, and then the three, four or five mile mark, even the 490th mile mark, 70 times seven. We forgive 77 times or 70 times seven. Let's say thieves broke into a woman's house, took money, took her phone, damaged a lot of things. For a season, she spent time in the neighborhood of denial and anger. But then she prayed, Lord, I know that I'm supposed to forgive these thieves. Please help me, God. And what happened? She takes five steps forward. But then she has to stand in line for two hours getting a replacement phone. And she begins to feel anger toward the thieves again. She takes three steps back. And then she prays again, God, I know you want me to forgive these thieves. Please help me. She takes five steps forward. Then her child needs money for school supplies that she realizes she doesn't have it. She feels more anger again toward the thieves. She takes three steps back, but then she says, God, help me. And she takes five steps forward. Time comes, Christmas is approaching. She needs money for gifts and special foods. She feels the anger again, three steps back, prays again, takes five steps forward. Finally, on the anniversary of the robbery, She's able to pray to God without feeling any of those feelings of anger anymore. She has worked her way consistently through the forgiveness cycle. 77 times, 70 times seven. Lloyd LeBlanc the, was the father of David LeBlanc, 17 year old who was murdered by Patrick and Eddie Sonye. And when the neighbor started harassing Mrs. Sonye for her son's actions, it was actually Lloyd LeBlanc that came to, her, came to her house and brought her a basket of fruit. He said he was a parent too. 
he said to her he understood that she wasn't responsible for his son's murder. You wonder, how can a parent do that? Lloyd unpacks his story. He tells how the sheriff brought him to the morgue to identify his son's body. David said, here is this beautiful kid, 17 years old. He had been shot in the back of the head, sadly. And the sheriff pulled out his body out onto that cold tray. And, Lord, and Lloyd realized, here's a man. He knew that he was good with his hands. He was used to fixing things. But he looked down at his son and he said, I can't fix that. And he began to pray the Lord's Prayer. And as he began to pray the Lord's Prayer, he came to that line about forgiving those who sin against us. And he admitted in his heart, he says, Lord, I don't feel that. But he knew in his heart that's where he needed to go, and that's where he ultimately did go. Forgiveness says, God, I'm not going to let this anger, I'm not going to let this resentment, I'm not going to let this hatred kill me. With your help, Lord Jesus, I ask you will help me to remain kind and loving and forgiving. And forgiveness is this journey. It's, it's, it's this cycle that we go through, the cycle of forgiveness. It's not just a single act. We reaffirm our commitment to forgive and to keep on forgiving. Further, we let the offender face the consequences of their actions. Here's the scriptures from Numbers 5, 5 to 7. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it, to, give it all to the person they have wronged. You see, just because we have forgiven someone doesn't mean that they should not be punished for what they have done. Justice must still be done. And this scripture's passage tells us clearly if something was stolen, restitution needs to be made. We also realize that there are some things that happen to us and other people. Some things are taken away that can never be repaid. But justice can still be done. Justice can prevent somebody else from experiencing hurt in the future that maybe we've experienced. And justice can actually give that other person an opportunity to repent, move them to repentance. The job of punishing criminals, God gave that job to the government. I know we see a lot of movies and they have somebody takes justice into their own hands and they're out there to get revenge and it makes a good storyline for the movie, but that's not what God has designed. God gave that role to the government. We don't want to take that into our hands. And further, we determine in forgiving others, we determine if and when you and I are, are able to trust the offender again. I've forgiven people sometimes. I've been wounded, but that doesn't necessarily mean I trust them because trust is earned, trust is re-earned. Interesting story in the Old Testament about Joseph. And I was just telling Donna this morning that as I began to think about this story, I finally understood one piece that I never understood. Here is Joseph, this favorite son of Jacob. His brother sold him to, to some Egyptians as a slave. But now he, the story unfolds in the book of Genesis. He's in, he's in Egypt, and eventually he finds himself in the second place of command in the kingdom. A famine occurs. And there is Joseph's brothers. They come all the way to Egypt. They show up because they need food. They don't recognize Joseph at that time, but he recognizes them. And he tests them. He wants to see if he can trust them. Genesis 42, 18 to 20 is part of that story. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. 
if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back to your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Well, the story continues. They go back. This, they realize, okay, their money is now returned to them. But the famine continues. They have to go back to Egypt to get another food supply. And Joseph tests them again. And he finally reveals himself. Joseph, we understand, he had already forgiven his brothers. He says it. He had already forgiven them. But he wanted to see if he could trust them. He wanted to see if they had changed. He didn't wait and then forgive them. He had already forgiven them. And when trust has been broken, it takes time for it to be rebuilt. But little by little, as we have interactions with somebody, if we have good experiences with that person who has wounded us and hurt us, we can begin to trust them again. It may take some time. It may take some time before we're able to trust them completely. And in some situations, we may never, it may never actually be safe to trust that person again. Now, we might want to say, oh, I just want this relationship to be fully reconciled. But for reconciliation to take place, it actually is on both sides of the fence. And in certain situations, like abuse, okay, reconciliation is not always appropriate. We can't trust the people. And we grow. We allow trust to, to grow when it can. Questions, how do we forgive others? Beth Moore and her husband, Keith, they were spending time in Angola, who has gone through a lot of war situations. And at that time in their ministry, they were trying to draw attention to tens of thousands of malnourished people. They saw sights and sounds of living death. A friend, said to, a friend said to them, one of the most frustrating things is that in the villages where they have received seed, they often eat the seed rather than planting it and bringing forth the harvest. Beth thought about that. She couldn't get that statement out of her mind. And suddenly she had an answer to a question that she had most asked, often asked God, why do some people see the results of the word and others don't see the results of God's word? And she says, why have many of us read books on forgiving people, known the teachings that were true and right, cried over them, marked them up with highlighters, yet remained in our bitterness? She said, it's because we ate the seed instead of sowing it. In other words, we know in our heads, oh yeah, I'm supposed to forgive. We know what to do, but do we practice it? Do we live it out? Do we eat the seed instead of sowing it? Another important question, why should we forgive people? Well, if we don't forgive, we're gonna find ourselves in bondage. It's like if you don't forgive someone, that person is tied to you with a rope. And you're dragging that person around with you wherever you go. And it can be exhausting. It can be frustrating. You take a walk, that person is there. You eat supper, that person is there. You try to work, you try to pray, you try to run away, and that person is there in your mind. And everywhere you go, that person is there because that person is tied to you with a rope. You and I have had conversations with people. And all of a sudden, in this conversation, they bring up a situation where they were wounded years ago. And you wonder, why is that situation so fresh in their minds, like it happened yesterday? The reason is because that person they have not forgiven is tied to them with a rope. They're still dragging that person around.
What does forgiveness do? It cuts the rope. Here's my visual for today. <laughs> forgiveness cuts the rope. Forgiveness cuts the rope. Got it. <laughs> Forgiveness frees us from anger, from bitterness. When we have been sinned against, it is totally normal to feel angry. But the scripture says, you let that anger fester, what happens? Satan can get a foothold. And what I found in this in passage here in 2 Corinthians, Paul takes this whole idea of forgiveness and the lack of forgiveness, and he links it together with being outwitted by Satan. He makes the connection. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. He puts the two together. And we, become, we can become slaves of anger, slaves of bitterness, and it can begin to eat out our soul, it can destroy us. And we're the ones who suffer. We can even face physical issues. Headaches, ulcers, heart problems. And sometimes people feel like they just want to retaliate. And sometimes in that retaliation, it ends up being evil. Sometimes we find ourselves doing the very evil against people that have offended us and even worse things. And there's also another principle here that if we don't forgive that bitterness that we feel, that can be passed on to our children. Talked about blessing our families here today. Blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Amen. But if we don't forgive the bitterness, the revenge, the violence can continue for generations. Forgiveness breaks that cycle. Cuts, cuts the rope. <laughs> and forgiveness shows that we understand how much God has forgiven us. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Wayne Cordero, he imagines this very humorous conversation to illustrate how much God has forgiven us. He imagines himself in a friend of his, Nancy Beach, in her driveway. And Nancy comes out and says, Wayne, that's my favorite cat that you ran over. Wayne says, oh, Nancy, I'm sorry. I just won the lottery and I was so excited. She says, I don't care what you won. You just ran over my cat. And Wayne says, I, I know I can't bring it back to life. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? And she says, no, I can't forgive you. You can't bring my cat back to life. I can't forgive you. You are just a mean, cruel person. Oh, Nancy, I'm so sorry. I know I can't bring this cat back, but you know, I just won the lottery. So here's a check. And I know I can't bring your cat back, but would $50,000 help you forgive me? Here. And she looks at the check and she says, whoa, I, for I forgive you, brother. Hallelujah, you are absolutely forgiven. God bless you. <laughs> and when he says, you know, Nancy, while we're on the subject, you, you have trouble forgiving people? And she said, well, you know, now that you mention it, my neighbor did call me a name the other day. Well, Nancy, here's a check for $25,000. Oh, yes, he's forgiven. He is completely 100% forgiven. And Wayne asks, well, is there anything else? Well, she says, yeah, my uncle did something. Okay, here's $100,000. And here's another $500,000 just to make sure there's no residue of unforgiveness left in you. 
Will you forgive everybody now? She said, well, yes, I am the most forgiving person in the whole world. I forgive everybody. Jesus, he didn't pay just $100,000 or $5 million or $10 million so that God could forgive us and God could give to us the power to forgive. He gave his life. He died in our place. And when we forgive others, we begin to understand how much God has forgiven us. And Jesus poured out his blood on the cross to give us the power to forgive others. Another question. Well, what if we are the ones who cause the offense? A study was conducted by the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research. They talked to 1,423 adults. And they learned in their research that over half, 52%, had forgiven others for past transgressions. Three quarters of the people that were interviewed believed that they had come to the place where they felt like God had forgiven them for their mistakes. 43% had actually gone to others to be forgiven and forgiving others, though they realized was a little bit easier because 60% would let themselves off the hook. They forgave themselves. But what they did in their research, and they made an interesting discovery, they found that asking for forgiveness raised people's stress levels. Because asking for forgiveness, that's the hard thing. That's the hard part. But if we have caused the offense, we ask for forgiveness from those we have offended. Matthew 5, 23 to 24, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you've offended them. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. We allow the Spirit of God to do his work in us. We, we allow him to show us how much we have hurt him, how, we, how much we have hurt other people. Sin should make us sad. The Bible talks about godly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance. We, we, James talks about weeping over our sin. I mean, when you look at the example of like contrasting Peter and Judas, because they both felt sad and sorrow over what they had done in denying Christ. But Peter's sorrow, his sadness, when he repented, it brought him closer to God. And Judas' sorrow, well, we know he felt remorse, but he took his own life. We take responsibility for what we have done. We own up to our sin. We, we listen to the people that we have wounded. We listen to the pain that we have caused. And we ask those that we have offended to forgive us. We don't defend ourselves. We don't blame them. We don't even demand that they trust us right away. We ask for forgiveness. And then we also realize as God forgives us as well, we forgive ourselves. Because we struggle in this area too, don't we? We feel like, oh, I still feel guilt. I still feel shame. I still feel regret. I've repented, but I still feel like I'm not sure if I'm forgiven. It's helpful to remember scriptures like one, Psalm 103, verse 12, which says, for as far as the east is from the west, so far it has removed our transgressions from us. God forgave you, you forgive you. You can ask somebody to pray for you. At the end of our service here today, you'd say, you know, I, I just want a pastor to pray for me. I want an elder to pray for me. I'm struggling in this area. Give us the opportunity to do that. It's a process that can take some time. The roots of our struggles 
It can be deep. But gradually, the feelings of our hearts can change and begin to align with the truth that we know in our heads. Only one petition in the Lord's Prayer has any condition attached to it. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Luke 11, 4. Based on a true story, the movie Antoine Fisher tells of a young man who grew up in an abusive foster home. And over the years, Antoine grew bitter. He grew bitter toward his natural family for giving him up. And by the time he had enlisted in the Navy, his, angry, his anger had got him into so many fistfights that eventually he was sent to the psychologist in the Navy, Jerome Davenport, played by Denzel Washington. Davenport becomes like this father figure to Antoine. And they build this trust relationship together. And a scene unfolds, they're celebrating a Thanksgiving meal together. And after the meal, Antoine shares a very powerful poem with Davenport. Davenport is work, helping him to try to see, trying to raise this issue, helping Antoine try to find healing. Antoine hold, takes, uh, has a folded piece of paper and gives it to, to Davenport. And Davenport reads it aloud very thoughtfully. Who will cry for the little boy, lost and all alone? Who will cry for the little boy, abandoned without his own? Who will cry for the little boy, he cried himself to sleep? Who will cry for the little boy, who never had for keeps? Who will cry for the little boy, who walked the burning sand? Who will cry for the little boy, the boy inside the man. Who will cry for the little boy who knew well hurt and pain? Who will cry for the little boy who died and died again? Who will cry for the little boy, a good boy he tried to be? Who will cry for the little boy who cries inside of me? Davenport says, this is excellent, Antoine. He said, you're good at being honest. You're more honest than most people. Even in your anger, the only thing that you're not honest with yourself about is that you need to find your own family, your natural family. Davenport says, you're, you're upset with them because you, you feel like they didn't come to your rescue. Maybe they didn't know. Antoine lashes out, well, how could they have not known? Davenport says, that's the question you need to ask. Regard without ill will, despite an offense. He said, Re regard ill will, without, regard without ill will, despite an offense. Davenport says, that's the West Webster's definition of forgiveness. Antoine says, why do I have to forgive? Davenport says, to free yourself so that you can get on with your life. And we can simply add to that, God calls us to forgive because he has forgiven us. And Jesus is the one who sets us free. Only one petition in the Lord's Prayer has any condition attached to it. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Let's pray together. Father, our hearts are broken, convicted.
Lord Jesus, there's people in our hearts and minds that we are struggling to forgive. You're bringing their faces. You're bringing their names before us, even in this moment. And in this moment, we say, Lord, here and now, we forgive. We release them. Because, Lord Jesus, you have forgiven us. And we don't want to hold that offense against them. And, Lord, if there are people that we need to go and ask for forgiveness, Lord, give us the, the strength, the courage to ask for forgiveness. Oh, God, as we forgive others, we take that tin snips and we cut the rope. We cut the rope today. In Jesus' name, amen. The dark won't stop the light from getting through. We do.